All right, our special guest for tonight is Jeff Gonzalez with Trident Concepts. Jeff is a former Navy SEAL and nationally recognized weapons and tactics instructor. He's the president of Trident Concepts and the current host of the Bulletproof Workshop podcast. His background comes from naval special warfare as a respected operator and instructor. He pioneered new advances in weapons and tactic instruction and his understanding of adult learning, detailed curriculum development, development, and rigorous adherence to performance standards continue to set him apart. In recent years, Jeff has been recognized as a subject matter expert on concealed carry. He's the author of the Concealed Carry Manual and is invited to speak all over the nation about weapons, concealed carry, and self-defense. So let's welcome Jeff Gonzalez onto the show. Hi, Jeff. Hi. Thank you for having me on the show. Oh, yeah. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. You bet. Is there anything that I missed in the intro there uh, about your background that you need to fill us in on? I don't think so. Very well done. I think that covered all the big bases. So thank you. Okay. Okay, great. Well, uh, I was really intrigued as a podcaster myself about your Bulletproof Workshop. Could you tell us what that is about and how that came to be? Um, so the Bulletproof Workshop is a project that myself and the crew from AR15.com uh, kind of put together, principally uh, Juan Avila. He is the, the guy that approached me and asked if I'd be interested in doing a podcast. We've wanted to work on a project for a long time, and, and the orbits just had it aligned to allow us to do that so when he approached me uh let's see it would be tw- it would be november of 2021 um i was like okay this is something that i haven't done before i'm intrigued by it i don't really have a lot of i've been a guest on numerous podcasts so i have an understanding mm-hmm. from this seat but not necessarily an understanding from say your seat so uh it took some time to reflect on it called up a bunch of my friends that have their own podcast and asked them some pointed questions that gave me some great insight. And so we decided to go ahead and pull the trigger and we kicked off the uh, Bulletproof Workshop last year. And we officially started uh, like probably June, I think is when we recorded our first podcast. And, uh, you know, we are continuing to have a great time. I've, the, the premise behind the show is, is kind of, um, I, I don't know if I would say it's different, but I focus on things that a lot of people may not focus on, which is the failures, the lessons learned, the obstacles that successful people had to um, overcome in order to become successful. So I don't always talk about the the unicorns and the rainbows. We talk about some of the harder things that mm. maybe some people are uncomfortable with, but have. Mm-hmm tremendous value to the general public as far as being able to identify what those problems are, solve those problems and come out on the positive side of the equation and in the, in the end. Yeah. That sounds really interesting. Was there a particular guest or a particular topic that you remember that really stood out Mm -hmm. to you? Ooh, we have had so many good guests in such a short time period. I've been so blessed to have an amazing roster of people that have come on and ooh, singling them <laughs> out is tough. Yeah. I, I've had so much fun though. I, that's the, that was the unexpected allure, I suppose. Was like, I, I wasn't sure what to expect. I knew mm-hmm. it would be different. I knew that it would give me, uh, it would challenge me in some respects. So I was looking forward to that. But what I was not expecting was as much uh, fun that I'm having yeah. more fun than I thought thought I would in the, uh, you know, in the, in the, in the hot seat, if you will. So that's, that's been a lot of fun. Yeah, definitely. Hi, Adam. Hi, Jeff. So, so good to see you again. Um, Likewise. I'm, I'm, I'm deeply interested in your podcast because it goes far beyond shooting from what I've seen and understand Mm -hmm. of it. And, Mm -hmm. and to me, that's, that's extremely intriguing. Are you finding that, your podcast and the guests that, that come on, are they also, do, do they look far outside the gun community? That's what I'm seeing, but it, are you looking to take it far beyond just the gun community? Is that where you're going with this? Well, yeah, the original idea behind the show was not to necessarily pigeonhole us as a, as a 
two way firearms training, uh, gun related podcast. The point behind the podcast was, Hey, we want to look at what's the secret to success. How have, how have those that we recognize as being successful, how have they achieved success? And when I started to kind of unravel that, the big, the, the thing that stood out to me was that so many of them had a lot of, a lot of failures, a lot, I shouldn't say a lot of failures, but they had failures and they had a lot of obstacles that they had overcome in order to be successful. And, and those that were successful, no matter the obstacles found solutions. And a lot of those solutions, what we're discovering can kind of fall into some common out, like some common, common buckets, themes. if you will. Like there's, yeah. a, there's this bucket, you know, there's this bucket, there's this bucket, there's this bucket. So we're, we're finding that these successful people either have combinations of the buckets or they kind of reside in a single bucket as far as what they were doing to be successful. So, mm-hmm. you know, I'm not, I'm not comfortable or ready yet to kind of start to identify what those buckets are. Cause we still, you know, we've got about like 30, three-ish podcasts that we've done so far. Um, I want to kind of keep tracking this and find out like, okay, is this just me or was this just the first batch of guests that all kind of fit into (laughs) these buckets? What's the deal? But it's very interesting to see that. Um, We've had some 2A community folks. Uh, Obviously, we had uh, Juan Avila come on. He uh, obviously is the captain of AR15.com. He's kind of steered that ship. We've had some other folks from within the industry and, and it's not like we're excluding the industry from, from coming on board. It's just, that's not a precursor to be being invited. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. really what we're looking for are those that have, and I'm not talking about success through a silver spoon. I'm talking about those that really had to uh, overcome some challenges that maybe the general public, you know, the, the, the idea that I had in my head is that somebody could be in a situation where they are, confronting a lot of difficulties, challenges, whatever you want to call them. And maybe they're up against the wall. Maybe they're having a hard time navigating through this. Maybe they are also at that breaking point where it's just like, okay, screw it. I'm not, I'm not, I don't know if I want to go down this road. And so by identifying some of these key characteristics from successful people and sharing that information with the general audience, the hope is that, oh, wait a minute, uh, I can do that. That's something that, you know, that's, I could, I could figure out, I could, I can do that. And so it's kind of like bringing the secret sauce, if you will, to the general public when mm-hmm. it comes to those that have been recognized as successful. And we define success in a very broad stroke. It's not necessarily right. a monetary value right. or the number mm-hmm. of likes that you have. It's, it's in your own field of expertise. And, and we've had a very eclectic um, group of guests that have come on everything from, you know, folks that are in the fitness industry, we've got folks that are in the entertainment industry. Uh, we have folks that are on the political spectrum. We've got best-selling authors. You know, it's been fantastic. And I've really, like I said, I really enjoyed it more than I thought I was. <laughs> so, so the interesting part to me is that you're hitting all, do- all really broad domains of life here. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You are in the in the gun training space. You're in the tactics space, but mm-hmm. you're you're really seeing the bigger picture, the bigger mission, and you're hitting all aspects of life. So in that case, if I can run an observation by you and see what you think of it, too, in my mm-hmm. in my perspective, it seems like people who tend to be oftentimes successful. And, and again, as you said, we're not defining it monetarily, but successful in life, it seems like usually they've had to walk through literally their own trials of fire. They've almost had to have have visited deep failures, um, uh, deep hardships, everything else to kind of rise above. And it seems like if you don't have that struggle, that that almost beat down that you go through the, the the true failures that really rock the soul. If you don't have that, it's much harder to get to that higher level of, of really excellence, almost no matter what the endeavor is. Am I wrong in that? Or do you see the same thing? Um, I, 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 I do agree with you. I, the way that I look at it is that, you know, life has um, life is about tension and friction and, some of us have to endure more tension, more friction. And so our momentum is tied to that. You know, the, like those that have been able to figure out how to grease the skids, if you will, and reduce the tension and friction, either are able to attain success sooner or longer. One of the two. So um, you know, everybody that we've talked to that had a success story had 
plenty of friction and tension that they had to deal with. And, and it comes in over right, everything from, you know, personal issues, emotional issues, financial issues, you know, professional issues. They've all had to overcome something, if you will, to help them to achieve that level of success that they, that they've deemed successful for themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We talked about that on the, mm -hmm. on the podcast last night, Adam, we were talking about strength through struggle. That was one of the topics. And so, um, yeah. Jeff, do you have anything personally in your life? Because obviously you're interested in this and I'm, I'm sure you've had your share of, of struggle in your life to get to where you are. Is there any, any example of a lesson of that, that you've gained through struggle that's helped your mm. success. That is a good question. And, and it's like the, at the point in my career where I'm at right now, the one thing that I could say that probably stands out would, would, would probably be persistence and tenacity. Uh, mm. And that's, that's, a, that's one of the common themes that we're hearing from our guests. Uh, you know, that you're going to, you're going to be facing obstacles and challenges. You're going to have setbacks. You're going to have failures. You're going to have a lot of doors shut in front of you. You're going to be kicked out of a lot of rooms. You're going to have all these types of problems. And a lot of people might, might be tempted to kind of like throw the towel in after one or two. Uh, if you are convinced, if your convictions are strong about what you're trying to achieve and mm -hmm. you can stay focused on them the the way that you are able to kind of navigate through those waters is just persistence and and the other thing i think uh, i'm really good at breaking things down into bite-sized pieces i i joke about this in many cases but one of the one of the mantras that i would tell my kids all the time was how do you eat an elephant and <laughs> the answer is you know one bite at a time so you know that same kind of life lesson that I've tried to pass on to my kids was because that's how I saw success in my, in my career, uh, looking like ginormous obstacles, huge barriers, whatever you want to call them, breaking them down into bite-sized pieces allowed me to navigate on the board and overcome them. So that's kind of like those two things, persistence, tenacity, as well as just taking things in smaller bite-sized pieces until you can finally, you know, mm -hmm. overcome the, you know, there'll come a point when the momentum shifts in your favor. It's mm -hmm. just getting to that point that I think a lot of people struggle with, or they find um, it's too difficult or it's too, too much. There's too much tied to it and it's not, you know, the juice isn't worth the squeeze anymore or something, yeah. else, something along those lines. Yeah. And what about adapting? How important do you feel like that is to success? Not just as like, if we can, we can frame that in the reference of gun training of being able to adapt to your situation in real time. But I do think that's a life lesson as well. Would you agree? Yeah. So, um, everything's going to look a certain way. Like we, we say this in, in the, in the tactical world, um, the best, the best laid plans, very rarely survive contact with the enemy. Mm -hmm. And so you have to understand that you can have in your mind an idea about how this should go. And as you enter into the arena and you start to deal with these obstacles, these barriers, you start to discover that, okay, it's not exactly like that. It doesn't, you know, and, and I think a lot of times the reason that you experience that is because you did not necessarily have all the knowledge. You didn't have all the information. And mm -hmm. as you start to get this information, you start to adjust your plan. You start to recognize, okay, I need to shift to the left versus going to the right. And, but you didn't have that information to begin with. Otherwise you would have recognized I need to go to the left. So as you kind of start to uh, muddle through a lot of this, you have, I mean, you, you, you have a choice. You, you could try to stay the course and stay on the right side and, and just, you know, head down, keep your feet moving. But if you are, if you're willing to at least acknowledge that there might be a different path, there might be a better way, there might be an, like some, something else to consider, that's where that adaptability, I think, comes in. There, there's obviously everything has pros and cons. Where I see adaptability is when you run into problems 
and the problems don't match up with your original plan, you're going to have to either adapt to mm -hmm. the new, the newness, the novelty, or, you know, it's the old adage to just get a bigger hammer kind of thing, which mm -hmm. I don't always feel like is ideal. Is that one of the most common things you see in your class is uh, a struggle with adaptability from a mindset perspective? Or is there, what do you see as one of the most common mm. struggles from your students in class? It, it depends on the class. Um, I would say at the lower levels, the hardest thing that I feel like, and these are sometimes self-imposed on students or from students, but I think the hardest thing that we see is more of self-induced obstacles. Uh, mm. Things like, uh, I can't do this, or um, I'm not good enough, or, um, you know, they're dealing with some sort of some other issue that makes it harder for them than others, maybe. That's something that we see at the lower levels. I think as you mature as, um, as a shooter, then there's new obstacles that you come into contact with. And I think the two biggest ones are, well, actually, I guess I could throw a third one in there. The first one is complacency. You know, you get kind mm -hmm. of caught in this cycle of good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Mm -hmm. And it kind of lends itself to like not put in the work in anymore. You, the work that you put in to get good, you no longer feel necessary or you don't, you don't feel like you have to keep doing that. Mm -hmm. And maybe some people can get away with that. There's no such thing as far as I'm concerned as natural born athlete. There's somebody that's disciplined and trained and that's, that, that's the difference. Um, the second problem that we see with, more of a mature shooter is going to be their um their lack of and this can tie in with complacency but it's a little bit different but their lack of consistency you know they get to that same level and the to get to that that level whatever they deemed to be good enough required them to be consistent and and as we find ourselves in that plateau uh, we start to recognize that I don't have to put the same amount of work in to get the same outcome that I can kind of coast a little bit. And that lends itself. That's the complacency coming out. And so mm -hmm. when that does is that then breaks down your training regime to the point where now your frequency of training becomes more sporadic or, you know, almost mm -hmm. nil or non, 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 yeah. non-existent. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of becomes an issue. And then the third thing I think is, when we um, lose like the appetite for progress or progress, maybe not hungry right anymore. Right. There becomes kind of like, a, you, you know, you, you're that, that fire that burned inside of you in the beginning, early stages, maybe has kind of subsided a little bit and they're mm -hmm. just not quite willing to put in because at, at a certain point too, you start to recognize how much, energy it takes, how much time it takes, how much, you know, of your resources it takes to, to continue to progress to the next level. It doesn't, it's, it doesn't get any easier. Like everybody that wants to be at, you know, we define five levels of skill, the beginner, the beginner, basic, intermediate, advanced, and the elite. And everybody that wants to be an advanced level shooter, they say that until they recognize how much time and energy is required to stay at that level, not just to get to the level, mm -hmm. but to stay at the level. Mm -hmm. And that's why we focus a lot more of our programs on the intermediate level side of the house, because that's more realistic for the average person that is not willing to invest that extra level. And then, of course, there's a level on top of that, which is the elite level. And that's that's a whole other ball game, But just trying to get to the advanced level and stay at the advanced level, I think sometimes is more than people are actually willing to pay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. So, so if I could ask a question here, right? You are a naval, naval special warfare operator, right? A Navy mm -hmm. SEAL for those who don't know the term. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. for us mere mortals, right? Getting through just basic buds itself is mm -hmm. a superhuman effect. You, you superhuman endeavor, let alone mm -hmm. all the schools that you go to after. And then let alone, I would say, from what I've seen of it, remaining within the teams and the SEAL teams. 
is there anything in your in your childhood, your background, or just the internal fortitude of your spirit that built you up to where surviving that and doing that so well, succeeding in that, one, you could do, not only that, just passing buds and more, but then also remaining in the teams. And what kind of lessons did you pull from that that can now be now be given to people that you see in our train in the training courses you get to that takes them from the intermediate to the advanced to the uh, to the expert to the elite levels. Um, you know, I sat in your class for the first time ever. I got the honor to be there in December uh, this last year here in Phoenix. And I got to tell you, as I watched, as you dialed in deeper and deeper and deeper, I kept see- thinking that in my mind, you were going back to stuff that you literally pulled from childhood. If you pulled from the SEAL teams, you pulled from others to literally motivate other people. So hmm. are there lessons from the childhood, then your times in the teams, and then from here that you go, hmm. hey, this is where you can not only become a better shooter, but be kind of a better human being and a better life liver in your areas of what you do? That's a very insightful question. And um, like, I guess, and, and there was a lot of, there, there was a lot of basically divisions within that question. So to answer yeah. the first part, which was, like what, you know, what was there some sort of something from my childhood or something from my naval career that that is a lesson to pass to people that help me to, you know, persevere through all of that stuff. And the the right way to answer that question was as, as a kid, um, I was very I was very athletic. I love to be outdoors. I love to do things. I love to. Uh, be a part of things physically. I, I appreciated the physicality of whatever it was that I was trying to do. The, the it didn't really. I didn't understand that at the time. I didn't understand that I had you know ADHD and that I couldn't sit still, and then my OCD, which is everything has to be perfect, and all that other stuff. I didn't. I didn't have any real knowledge of that at that time. So when uh, for me, when I started to move forward, there was, you know, I always wanted to. I always wanted to do the very best that I could. And I had, even growing up as a kid, I had great influences in my life. Um, you know, I grew up in a, in a time period where we had a lot of families that were very well connected. Uh, my childhood friends from when I was a Peapod, I'm still close with to this day. And so we would do things together all the time. And there was whatever it was. We could be out skateboarding, uh, dirt bike riding, swimming, whatever the whatever the activity. In our group, there was always somebody that was the best at it, whatever that was. And what I discovered was that I wasn't really the best at any one thing, but I was either the second or maybe the third in all of them. Yes. And it was one of those things where as I progressed to my, you know, adulthood and particularly in the Navy come to appreciate that, you know, the, 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 the expanse of skills that are necessary within the, any special operations community for that matter is huge. And it's only getting bigger and being able to not necessarily, I didn't have to be the best at them. I just had to be good. And I can remember going through buds. I had a similar experience. There were, five of us that were always battling for the top spot in whatever the event could be the timed run, the O course, the swim. And the, the leadership position rotated pretty frequently. And every now and then I might, I might take the top spot for the run or the swim or the O course, but it wasn't consistent because these other guys were just animals and they were always doing the same thing, trying to beat out everybody else. But what I noticed was that the five of us were usually always coming in at the top, no matter what. And it was it was really interesting to see that, like, you know, whether it was the run or the swim or the O course, we were crossing the finish line generally within an arm's length of each other. And it just was like, who wanted it that who wanted it at that moment the, the, the most and or who had the best start or who did the best on one obstacle that always was a killer for everybody else. You know, just, it was all these little subtleties that really stood out and made a difference. So, you know, that, that kind of like uh, experience from childhood to my experience within the Navy to my current 
you know, in, as an instructor, there's a lot of hats that you wear. Um, you know, I don't have to be, I don't have to be the best shooter. I don't have to be the best, um, knowledge base. I don't have to be the best, de um, delivery of message. I just have to be good at all of them. And that's one of the things that we've excelled at is that, you know, we have a, a high enough level of expertise at all of those skill sets that it sets us apart from so many of our, of our peers and even, uh, even folks that have been around longer than us. Hmm. Huh. That's good stuff. Yeah, that's, that's good. Huh. And would you say that uh, to Jeff, that the greatest teachers are always somewhat curious. They're always somewhat learning. They're not stagnated. Um, I think that's part of it as well. Um, so what do you I think about that? So here's, here's how I like, this is something that is, that has transcended um, the various time periods of my life. The two things that I've tried to impart in my kids, as far as traits to develop. Uh, the first one is, is curiosity is to be curious, um, not necessarily for the sake of trying to learn more, but to understand more. And, and there's a difference between those two things. Then the second one is problem solving is to to really, you know, so if you can take those two traits and, and embody them as a, as a person, there's almost nothing that you can't do. You know, you, you're curious enough to want to understand and learn. Uh, I can recall my um, my standing orders from any of my superiors whenever I went to go to a school was that I had to have not just a working knowledge of whatever subject I was going to, but I had to have enough knowledge to be able to answer questions that were inevitably going to come from my teammates. Why do you do it that way? How come you can't do it like this? What's the reason behind that? So, you know, it, it put a lot of um, emphasis on, on really understanding whatever the subject was, not, mm -hmm. not, and, and that's why, like, I think it's important that you learn, but learning is not the same as understanding. And, mm -hmm. and that's, that's kind of like where we, uh, again, see the world a little bit differently. And problem solving is, as an instructor, uh, you know, in, in every fast, I mean, I cannot tell you how many times we would sit in our mission planning cycle, we would plan these missions down to the, the finest detail, we'd get on whatever it was the aircraft the boats whatever we were using the vehicles and almost immediately things were not going exactly according to plan and we have contingencies in place for a lot of these that allow us to adapt very quickly but really what made such a difference was our ability to problem solve in such real time and the other thing about problem solving is not just being able to do it quickly but to do it accurately and what i mean by that is a problem has a a right and a wrong answer, right? So when we're problem solving, it's not just, it doesn't mean just, okay, end it. It means to mm -hmm. end it on a positive note. Yeah. And that's the other thing that we try to get across to people is like, when you're problem solving, you're obviously, your, your goal is to solve the problem correctly. Yeah. And so in real time, seeing a problem for the first time that you didn't plan for and being able to quickly assess, surmise, and execute your response to that, to that problem that was not part of the plan is one of the things that, again, allows the special operations community to be as successful as they are, because that's, a, that's just something that is difficult to understand until you live it, until that's, that's, how, that's, and honestly, I took it for granted. I just thought that was how it was always done. I didn't realize that that was unique or special or different from so much of the world. Because again, in, in my world, that's it. That's all that existed. My, mm -hmm. you know, that was it. So when I stepped into the private world and started doing this for a living, um, there was a lot of things that kind of were difficult or challenging, I should say, is a better way to put it, challenging. What were some of those things so, that you weren't expecting? Mm. Sorry, Adam. That's okay. Well, sorry. Apologize for Adam. Um, <laughs> I think probably one of the big, the hardest things for me was not everybody trained like me. And that was 
that was the biggest obstacle that I had to overcome. I had a, um, <laughs> I was, I, I did, I just did a podcast with a very good friend of mine, another well, well-known and well-respected instructor in the field, uh, Craig Douglas. And we were talking on the podcast and he's like, dude, I can remember when I first got into this business that whenever your name got dropped, it was always with this serious tone that like, oh, that's no shit. That's like, yeah. Because back in the day, I, I, Adam, I know that you've been through one of our classes, but back in the day, the program was a lot different. It was, um, I would be, I would, I would go so far as to say it was a lot harder. And, and it was a reflection of how I trained. Yes. That's how I trained. That's how I, that's all I knew that the way that the, the original programming that we started with was basically raw, unfiltered training that w- we were doing at the time. And um, I realized that, ooh, ooh, this is not what people were expecting. This is not people really they didn't realize that it was this hard or they didn't realize there was this much at stake or they didn't realize it was going to take this much effort. And so um, with time, we, we changed the way that we, our programs flow, you know, and like I said, like um, we used to do what we call, we had two, two program tracks. We had an instructor track and we had an operator track and that was it. That was it. You were either in one of those two. You were either an operator or you were an instructor. And, um, you know, as time went on, we had to kind of change that a little bit and, you know, diversify both operator and instructor. Because, again, what it, an instructor to us does not necessarily mean the same thing as the instructor in, in the in this kind of industry, if you will. So it's a little that, that was another change, too. I, I, I came from a professional schoolhouse where that was your job, your job was to be an instructor. And the amount of time and energy that the Navy expended on actually training you to be an instructor was also very different. So, um, you know, these were things that were to some extent a culture shock to me. I had thought that everybody would see things the way that I did, which is how I trained, you know, the, the intensity, the frequency and the duration. No, not so much. (laughs) <laughs> it, it, but it's changed and, 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 you know, everything's cyclical. So some things, you know, ebb and flow kind of thing. Um, but I still feel like that was the hardest thing that I had to accommodate, which was mm. not everybody is, is, is looking at it the same way as I am. So on that note, right. As a, as a, as a, as a Navy SEAL, as a business owner, very successful business owner and speaker and trainer as, and I would tell you a, 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 a higher level, uh, crossfitter or type of workout type of person, right? Everything you've done seems like it's high intensity um, or high accomplishment in that case, right? So back mm-hmm. to your training and question here, uh, how do you take in what, 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 what kind of, how do you, how do you put this for the average human being, the average us normal people, how do you take it for others to take that and be like, okay, here's the model and process I t- high high intensity type of person without being the high intensity life, how do you become high functioning? What, what would Jeff, how do you guide people towards that? Cause really you're trying to get, do they either just have it or they area. don't have it, Jeff, oh, or, no, or can no. they learn the it? training you've had to do? Uh, so like, I think I understand your question. I think, um, how, how do, how, how do people, I'm trying to just reframe your question so that I answer it correctly. How do people, uh, how do people that want to be at that higher level actually get to that higher level? Like, what does it really take to get yes. there? Is that what you're asking? Yes. Yes, sir. So, I mean, the bottom line in, we, we, we call this your, the three T's, your time, talent, and treasure. If you want to get to, if you want to achieve anything in your life, you are going to have to put a lot of time, talent, and treasure into that. Time, obviously, is the most precious commodity because you cannot buy it. You cannot re- refund it. You cannot get it back. It's gone. Once it's once once you've expended it, it's gone. Um, the talent that you invest into what you're trying to achieve is also a difficult thing because it takes some, uh, and some activities are much more... Um, damaging to your... To, you know, like, uh, if you're... Like, it, it, being... 
work in, in any in any like in any part of the training or I'm sorry the military world is challenging it's it's very complicated it's 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 you're going to put a lot of work in and it's not easy meaning that you're going to take heavies it's hard on the body it's hard on the family it's hard on you know just a lot of other things that you you've got to invest into so you know we we kind of joke a lot uh, about being what we call a high mileage athlete but you've got to be willing to put that up there you've got to be okay with the harshness that is going to uh, you're going to experience and then you know once you kind of come to that conclusion that okay this is this is going to take a lot of my talent i'm, I'm going to you know i'm going to have to give a lot of blood sweat and tears to get there not everybody is like mm, totally committed there <laughs> and then the other thing is the 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 treasure aspect, you know, like it, it costs, um, you know, in this, in this, oh, my light just powered off for some reason. Let me just try it. Maybe it died. Nope. Um, so your, your treasure is, I mean, you have an investment in everything that you're doing. I, you know, the Navy, um, I can't remember. There's like some ridiculous number, some, monetary dollar amount of how much it takes to actually get somebody from basic training through buds not to mention their naval career as a seal i can't remember what that number is it's a ridiculously high number i guess my light is out um so the in this day and age to get that kind of training you have to invest money into that and that's not easy especially these days i mean it's you know you got to keep food on the table and a roof over the head. So, I mean, it's not as easy to get to that level and to invest that much time, talent, and treasure. Everybody's got to be balancing. It's a balancing act between how that all works. Um, a lot of times, you know, as you also, another factor that is something that we sometimes forget about, but it's front and center is, um, you know, as you age, your ability to kind of maintain the same tempo is also affected. And you have to now start to like acknowledge, not just acknowledge, but equate that to what does that really mean? Well, it means that my recovery time is a lot slower. Um, you know, I'm obviously not able to run the same times and distances that I used to, uh, you know, there's all sorts of changes going on metabolically that, make it a little bit harder for me to maintain that same intensity that I had 10, 15, 20 years ago. So depending on where you are in your life, you may also find an other obstacle other than time, talent, and treasure, which is the age issue and, and dealing with how that affects everybody. I mean, no matter who you are, it's going to have an, an impact. And based off what I've seen, most of that impact is, is not – it's not a positive. It's mostly negative. Right. Mm, that's good. I have one more topic I wanted to cover. Adam, did you have any follow-ups on that before I move on? Good to go. Okay. Okay. Um, well, I wanted to dive into the concealed carry part of your business, Jeff, because I know that you wrote a book about it mm -hmm. and that you travel and speak to lots of people about it. And so um, I wanted to ask you, what uh, your reason was for diving into the concealed carry market. And um, is there anything that you've noticed specifically about concealed, about concealed carry that's either not accurate or not exactly correct that, that you could set the record straight about? Okay. A lot of stuff to um, unravel there. Uh, so the reasoning behind the involvement in concealed carry was a, a roundabout type thing where we were asked by uh, an organization to bring, I guess you could say up to speed with what we call rest of world operations, meaning that we might be fighting a war over in this region, but we still have to uh, be prepared for skirmishes or any type of hostilities in the rest of the world. So, um, that means that we have a lot of guys that are actually doing low vis operations as part of what we call battlefield prep. And so we started to 
kind of uh, like back in my time, the the advances in battlefield prep were very I mean early. I mean we like we were relying so heavily on other organizations to provide us with intelligence. And at this at, at this point, a lot of what we do is based on generating our own intelligence, which is fantastic. But back then, you know, we still had to do it in kind of like the old fashioned, old school way. And um, it was unique in that sense. And so I had, I had exposure to that early on in my career. The folks that come to our classes get a much more broader explanation or kind of history behind that. But I first started carrying concealed in the performance of my duties. And like, I think it was 1989 and concealed downrange in, in a non-permissive environment. So it was something that I started doing very, very early on. And we kind of, again, there was nothing of note as far as training was concerned back then. Hmm. So a lot of it was just, you know, again, the, the creativity, that curiosity. And then what ended up happening was as we uh, kind of got called back up, if you will, the um, the interest gained in popularity and we started doing it for one organization. Uh, word got out. So another organization asked us and the word got out and then we tried to do it there. And then we went from the East Coast to the West Coast and we started doing it outside of the uh, of the military, started doing it for law enforcement. And then as we started doing it for law enforcement, it put us more it put us more close to the general public at that point. And then people started paying attention to us at that point. Um, and that was back in about 2014. And literally, I can remember we went from maybe doing one unit level concealed carry class. We, it wasn't called that back then, but one one unit level per year to all of a sudden we're doing like I would average probably about between I would say between 22 to 26 classes a year. And. Those classes were generally broken up between pistol and rifle. And all of a sudden we started doing almost half of our schedule was concealed carry. Mm -hmm. And that was during 2014 to about 2017. So for about three years, it, it just was the lion's share of our, of our op tempo. And as we started to do it more and more, it became more and more popular. The concealed carry movement, we were right at the apex, right? I shouldn't say the apex, right at the beginning of the concealed carry movement. Like the, the, mm -hmm. the most, we, we, there's like different um, high points within the concealed carry uh, history, if you will. And we kind of hit at a point where it, it, it had just, concealed carry was in its infancy at that point. And all of a sudden, it's now starting to become a little bit popular. And then as we get to about 2017 to 2019, we see a huge spike. And then as we roll into 2020, we see an even bigger spike. And now here past 2022, we're at an all-time high as far as concealed carry is concerned. So, you know, mm -hmm. we've been sought after by just about every, every organization that in the performance of their duties, they have to be concealed we've worked with and trained with. Um, and then we, we do a lot of work with other more public organizations to just kind of help uh, get the word out there as far as the importance behind not just the subject of concealed carry, but also to try to reduce barriers to entry for a lot of people that have, whether they're self-imposed, economically imposed, or geographically imposed restrictions, we've tried to work very hard to help provide answers for all those people in those situations. That's good. And the other part of the question was, um, is there anything being taught that you've noticed that's either not accurate or not exactly correct that, that kind of, that you'd like to address? We'll just say. I mean, that's, I mean, that's a little bit harder question to unravel. And the reason being is that it, there was a time. Like, so if you were to take off the table something that's unsafe, all right? So if it's unsafe, clearly mm -hmm. that's wrong. It needs to be addressed. Right. Yeah. So you take that off the table. And what you're left with is you're left with a lot of things. Um, one of the things that separates us from a lot of other people is that we don't just focus on, you know, on body carry and particularly on the waistband type carry, 
we focus on a lot of other methods of carry. And every now and then we'll hear people that will badmouth a particular method of carry. And, and, and the, again, the reason why we're where we're at is because we, we have a much greater knowledge base uh, or understanding of the customer base and the clientele base. There's um, like within the firearms industry, you've got, I would maybe put it at two to 3% at the top of, uh, of this industry are people that I would consider to be a re- returning student. They're not a one and done. They've, mm-hmm. they've at least taken more than one training class. All right. So that's, that represents like about two to 3% of the actual firearms industry. And that's mm-hmm. being generous. That's yeah. being very generous. Very. The one and done represents maybe about another two or 3%. And so you have everybody else. Mm-hmm. And the reasons that everybody else hasn't invested in training and education is, is a variety of reasons, but a lot of them is because they're told they can't do it. Hmm. So, uh, well, if you don't carry um, appendix, you're going to die on the streets because it's fast, it's easy, it's the best, it's blah, blah, blah. Well, uh, surprisingly, a lot of people are not comfortable with that. And so when, they're, when they hear that, when they're told that, when somebody encourages that, they decide that they're not interested in it. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't matter what I think as far as what's the best, what's the, uh, what's the most awesomest, what's going sur- to win the day. It doesn't matter what I think. What matters is that you have to be able to listen to the student and understand what the situation is the student has to work with. Mm -hmm. Everything from an adaptive athlete to a single mom to an elderly couple. All of these groups have unique challenges that are not the same as everybody else. That are Mm -hmm. so the problem with the industry is that they try to design training around two percent of the industry, Mm -hmm. which is, in my opinion, ridiculous. And the problem is is that the majority of those folks are fighting or arguing about which is better in the 2%. It doesn't matter. What matters is that if you're truly invested as, or if you are trying to be the best instructor that you can be, then you have to recognize that nothing's off the table. You may not like it. You may not do it. You may not suggest it, but you have to be able to address it and be able to provide valuable information that will help that individual to better themselves with whatever the tools are that they have, whatever it is. So my biggest complaint within the industry is the 2% that try to drive the training or try to influence training. And it's more prevalent these days because social media makes it really easy Mm -hmm. to um, create what I call a false narrative of what's the best. And the other problem too, that you'll see is that it's extremely subjective to put that out there best. Um, You know, one of the things that we do very well is that we collect data. I mean, we've been collecting data since we first started training. Um, The very first, you know, test that we ran way back in the day, we still have the scores from that. And the reason for us to do that is so that we can actually have information to make informed decisions on. So when we sit there and talk about what's best, most of the time, best is a response to a very narrow and seldom occurring incident. The bottom line is that what the general public is training for is the, is an unknown, unknowable event. So to paint yourself in a corner so e- so quickly and easily with best makes it very difficult for the newer shooters to have that in- that investment. The most precious investment that they'll make towards you is their trust. Mm-hmm. And once you've lost the trust of the student, you're not going to get it back. It's it's unlikely, I should say, that you'll get it back. So they have to be able to trust you that that you can do your job, which is provide them answers. You can't provide them answers by telling them what they're doing wrong. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh, that's the that's that's the wrong gun, the wrong holster, the wrong position, the wrong this, the wrong that. The bottom line is that it may not be, in your opinion, the best. But you've got to be able, and this goes back to something that you asked me earlier in the podcast, which is adaptability. You as the instructor have to be able to adapt to what your student brings to the table. 
yeah. and be very and and the and and being very dogmatic about that means that you're not really a true educator. You're just somebody that espouses the same stuff over and over and over again, but you're right. not a true educator. That's so valuable. That was worth the price of admission right there, I think. <laughs> it really is. I mean, you're just laying down truth bombs left and right, and we all know it's true. And I don't think it's it, it it's uh, spoken about enough, honestly. I mean, I appreciate your honesty, and I think mm. others will too. Well, we are almost at the hour mark, and I really want oh, wow. to I really want to respect your time, Jeff. No um, I don't want to go over. Um, Adam, is there anything that you uh, have to wrap up here before we are done? Uh, beyond this, that, that last little bit, Jeff, I think was so valuable. Really, I, I wrote it down here as being a true educator is meeting the student where they're at. Mm-hmm. And and boy, that just that that was that was really well said. I, I was glad to hear you put all that together like that. Yeah, my that pleasure. Was a, that was great. Jeff, where can people go to uh, to train with you or do you have any upcoming classes you want to promote? We have lots of classes. Um, I guess the first thing would be if you're interested in learning more about our training classes, you can go to the website, tridentconcepts.com. I've seen it. Plaster, thank you. There it is. <laughs> um, you can go there and you can see our schedule. The The next class we have actually, ironically, is next week and it's, it's back in Phoenix. We're back there doing another Carry 2 class. Oh. Um, and yeah, that might be a little short notice for a lot of folks. That's, I don't know when this is airing, but, uh, that'll be next week, the 14th and the 15th. And then the next class after that will be here in Austin, Texas, and that'll be a pistol two class. And that's also on our schedule. I think that's March 4th and 5th. And then the rest, honestly, I can't recall what the rest of my schedule is. I just know <laughs> what the next two, I know where the, I know where I'm going, um, next two, sometimes three times. That's, that's the best that I can hope for. <laughs> that's pretty good i think yeah yeah that's like and the only reason why is just because of the you know the logistics i'm, I'm they're on the forefront of my brain yeah all right well let's so wrap jeff, up for today the, oh go ahead yeah jeff i'm in the phoenix area i'd like to come back to your class again i if if i can work with my schedule i'll do it um but oh, great. it would sure be an honor to come yeah, train absolutely. under you again absolutely 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 Right. Jeff, thank you for your time. We appreciate it so much. Uh, you you were wonderful to have on, and I've never uh, been to any of your classes yet, but um, <laughs> you were so gracious to spend time with us today, and we truly appreciate it. I think our audience will as well. Um, lots of truth and knowledge to bring to the table today, so thank you so much for that. Oh, it was my pleasure, and I also want to thank you for being so flexible. I know that um, I'm not easy to pin down, so thank you for your <laughs> flexibility and all of that. I really appreciate it. I kept after you, didn't I? (laughs) Very much so. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. You bet. All right. So we're going to move on here to what to expect for next week. So next week, we're going to have a very interesting guest on named Don Winch. I don't know if Winch rings a bell to you or not, but he's Adam's dad. And Don has been a missionary pastor and a theologian most of his life. And we're going to be talking about what the Bible says about self-defense and the defense of life. So because uh, if you've watched us for any period of time, you know that spiritual fitness is just as important important as skill building and physical fitness and everything else that we talk about on Defenders Live. And as Adam says, you must prepare your heart in advance for the aftermath of a violent encounter. And Don will be providing insight from the Bible in that area. So it'll be a really interesting conversation next week. We hope that you'll tune in for that. That'll be next Wednesday at 7 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. We'll see you then. Until then, take care.